Park here in uh, New York and I'm sitting here in my office uh, with Deepak home base with Jude Caravan. Hi Jude everybody. Caravan. Yeah. Dr. Jude Caravan. It's Dr. Jude Caravan. Dr. Jude Caravan and she is visiting from England and she lives very close to Glastonbury, the magical place of Merlin and you know <laughs> that magical part of the world. Um, Dr. Karan is uh, an expert um, in quantum physics, cosmology and uh, consciousness. So um, I was going to have a private conversation with her but then I asked myself why deprive the rest of the world. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Uh, Jude, tell me a little bit about your background starting with when you were four years of age. Well, when I was four years of age, I started to have walking between worlds experiences, precognitive dreams, out of body, telepathic, all the good stuff that was four years old is natural. You know, nobody was around to say that's nonsense or that's imagination. But it set me on a lifelong journey of curiosity into the nature of reality and realizing that it's far greater than the appearance of the physical world. Um, and alongside that, I was fascinated very early in terms of ancient wisdom teachings from India, China, Egypt, all of which were saying that you know the cosmos is a great mind, it's, it is consciousness, it's just co-creating the appearance of realities. And another thread was with science, you know, how does the language of science, how does science with its methodologies and ability to help us understand a consensus of reality help to put all of these pieces together? So that's been a lifelong path ever since and trying to weave those together and realizing that for a very long time science was well behind <laughs> ancient wisdom teachings and spiritual traditions and my sense now is it's finally beginning to catch up. So you went to Oxford and you did a degree in quantum physics? I did. I did a master's in physics. I specialised in quantum physics and yes. cosmology. I wanted to understand how the very tiny and the very big somehow might be able to reconcile the course Which of the time. still not. No. They haven't, right? Scientifically, they haven't, right? They're they haven't until now. But one of the reasons that I wrote my book about a year ago called The Cosmic Hologram is I think that the evidence is now coming forward to actually breaking through that impasse and actually going to a deeper level, which is that instead of trying to describe reality in terms of energy and matter and space and time, we take it to a more fundamental level of consciousness and Now you said your um, advisor in Oxford was... Uh... ...that weren't just a theoretical proposition, but actually could exist, these incredibly dense and extreme phenomena could actually exist and thank goodness they did and they do because all these years later my book The Cosmic Hologram takes research on black holes to describe the whole universe essentially. So post your masters, uh, since we're calling you doctor, um, what was your PhD in? I did the scenic route. I left university and academia and I went into business and I went into international business for 25 years. Mm -hmm. But I always kept curious about reality experientially and the leading edge science I kept abreast of and went through my own ideas and brought all these threads together. Mm -hmm. And But I wanted to honour mm -hmm. ancient cosmologies, the way that mm -hmm. our ancestors understood themselves mm -hmm. and the world around them. So I did a, a PhD in archaeology. Oh, in archaeology. Yeah. And in a sense, uh, cosmology is archaeology because we're looking at the past, right? Exactly. We're digging into the <laughs> cosmic hologram, as you call it, right? Yeah. Um, but um, one more thing is, uh, do you have your book here by any chance? I don't, but uh, I... Is it in your bag? Or? It isn't in my bag, but I didn't give you a copy some time ago, so you might have it somewhere around, or okay. tail might be able to find maybe, it. Maybe maybe um, our friend here can find it, uh, her book, so you, The Cosmic Hologram. Have you got a copy of it? Okay, no, so we can figure it's it out. Here. Well, otherwise, guys, this is a, your chance to pick it up. You know, it's available on Amazon. Of course, yeah. And uh, I'm going to read it now. I haven't read it, sorry. 
Not but, a problem. You know, but I, I will, but do pick it up and I'm sure it's on online too, right? Indeed. It's on Amazon. Amazon. And, and, okay, yeah. good. So tell us about the book, actually. It took 60 years to write. Okay. I wanted to write it for 60 years. Right. And the evidence wasn't there because what I was realising, both from when I was at Oxford and ongoing, is that quantum physics of itself isn't enough to explain the nature of physical reality, mm -hmm. and nor is relativity theory. Quantum physics describes energy and matter. Mm -hmm. Relativity theory describes space and time. As you say, they've never been able to be reconciled. So let's go a little before we go into mm. the book also. Would you say that subatomic particles, um, even though people think about them as material entities, mm. Uh, because they have units of mass and energy, mm. that actually they are human constructs for modes of knowing. Nobody's ever seen uh, a sub subatomic particle on what no, you see on tracks, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when um, you um, do these smashings mm. in Hadron Collider yeah. and you see something yeah. and you decide to call it a Higgs boson, uh, by the time you call it a Higgs boson or anything, it's not there. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. So it's a momentary uh, appearance mm -hmm. uh, of uh, an energetic uh, particle. I think that's really helpful, but I don't think it goes far enough. Oh, good. <laughs> and I think the problem is what we understand as energy and matter. Mm -hmm. And what's been realized, as you say, is that what we call physical reality is incredibly ephemeral. Mm -hmm. The more we dig down, the more ephemeral it, it is. It is, you know, yes. 99.9999. But the, the interesting thing that I think really is shedding new light on how we could describe physicalized reality is a realization that information, exactly the same digital information. That we're using right now. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Because in our technologies, we can take a photograph, we can pick up a microphone and take sound and, and content and visual appearances and describe them in digitized form. Any object we can do that with. What we're realizing more and more is our universe does that in reverse. It takes the information, not random data, but informational dynamic patterns of relationship, and from them is expressed as energy and matter, and indeed space-time, but in complementary ways. And so what is happening now is the ability to restate the laws of physics as algorithms of information, essentially instructing our universe how to exist and evolve as a unified entity. But of course, it's all consciousness. Of course. It's all consciousness. The very fact that the word is good, information, it almost suggests to give rise to form. Inform. And I use Into a hyphen. Inform. Exactly. Into inform. Yeah. So consciousness is informing, it's informing. itself as the universe. Yes, and so the consciousness universe. knows itself exactly. as the universe. Exactly. So I describe our universe as a universe soul, in a sense, a finite thought form in the infinite, and eternal mind of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So just as we have the ground of all being mm -hmm. as the infinite, eternal cosmos, then thought forms as universes mm -hmm. arise as unified entities. So mm -hmm. they exist and they evolve as unified entities, so starting 30... Just as our own mind evolves. Exactly. Or that species evolves, exactly. right? Exactly. So I've always thought, and I don't want to get sidetracked, we can come to my questions later, complete the whole story about how you think the you know, uh, theories of relativity... Could come together. Uh, and yeah. quantum physics, uh, how they come together in your view. Well. I go back about 150 years because mm -hmm. two of the most foundational laws of physics mm -hmm. are two laws of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. And the two laws of thermodynamics were derived by a, a researcher called Ludwig Boltzmann. Yes. And the first law says that the energy of a closed system always is conserved, it just changes form. If we take that, but we now go on 150 years and we realize that energy and matter are equivalent. Mm -hmm. And the latest cosmological view that is supported by Stephen Hawking is that our universe is finite and closed. So we can restate that first law of thermodynamics and 
more, most importantly still, that we can say that information can be expressed as energy and matter. We go from the energy of a closed system is conserved through to a first law of information or infodynamics that the energy matter of our universe is, is conserved. So uh, what you're saying is information is never lost, are you saying that? When it's expressed as energy and matter, mm. it just gets changed around. But that isn't enough, because why are the two laws of thermodynamics? I mean, Einstein always said the universe is as simple as it can be, but no simpler, so why two? And it's crucial, because that first law in describing information as energy matter is essentially a simple version of quantum physics, because yes. that's what it does. The second law, though, is key because the second law of thermodynamics started by saying that the entropy of a closed system always increases through time. And at Boltzmann's era, entropy was considered to be the microstates of a system, not order, disorder, but the number of microstates. So, for example... But then explain... Sorry to interrupt. No, not But not. see, entropy is a one-way street, but it's yes. punctuated by life forms. And that's part of the misunderstanding because this idea of syntropy and negentropy mm -hmm. was coming from this sense of order, disorder. So mm -hmm. a, a, a human body is ordered, mm -hmm. syntropy. Mm -hmm. Chaos is disordered, negentropy. Mm -hmm. But it misunderstood Boltzmann's original perception, which is we're not talking about order, disorder. We're talking about simplicity and complexity. Good. And we're talking about the increase now entropy understood as en information entropy as the informational content of a system. Mm -hmm. So we start with the second law, the entropy of a closed system always increases through time. We then look at relativity which equates space and time. We then recognise our universe as a closed system. We then recognise it began in its simplest form, its lowest informational entropy. And that informational entropy has been increasing every moment so as complexity as complexity as evolution as evolution because the first law allows our universe to exist the second allows it to evolve and it's actually describing entropy as informational entropy which essentially always increases through space time and that's a simple description of relativity theory so when we do that and we restate those two laws from thermodynamics to infodynamics the first law is about quantum, the second is relativity, but both of them are described in much more foundational ways as information expressed as energy matter, always conserved, informational entropy as the informational content of our universe, complexity and, and the flow of time. Mm -hmm. And when you add the hologram to that, what we have 13.8 billion years ago, instead of a big bang, is a big breath. It's the out-breath of Brahman. Hmm. It's... Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then the black hole is the, is the opposite? Is it, the not, out not so much. Are we going in the direction of out-breath too? When we go into a singularity ultimately? <laughs> That's not what the cosmology is suggesting. The cosmology is showing that the geometry of space is incredibly flat. And the, the way that space is expanding suggests that rather than a crunch or back to a singularity, what's most likely to happen is that outbreath, like a bubble. You know when a bubble comes to the end, it just dissipates into the air. Maybe our universe and all its knowledge, all its experience just goes into the cosmic planet. Into cosmic what? Into the cosmic planet. And the cosmic planet, but even there it exists uh, as a uh, probability or yes. possibility for recycling. Yes, you know. So the universe reincarnates. Itself. Reincarnates, and, and many many different universes. It's the grand. It's the grander sense of reincarnations you could ever have a sense of. Mm. So this is what your book is about. It is. You guys better read the book and uh, <laughs> listen to this uh, conversation over and over again. If you like it, uh, press like and um, share it with your friends because uh, you know I don't know when I'm going to meet Jude again and this is a great opportunity. So now let's go back a little bit uh, further into this whole thing. Do you want to say anything more about your book? First? No, just to say it's the first of a trilogy because 
we talk about understanding, experience, embodying unity awareness. Mm -hmm. So this really just gets over the, the with the evidence over the bridge from duality to essentially non-duality, mm -hmm. to from from the appearance of separation mm -hmm. to unified reality and unity awareness. So what you are actually postulating is the final unified field theory, in a sense. Yeah. As consciousness, the yeah. consciousness isn't something we have. It's what we how are receptive about. are traditional cosmologists? Because you know they call me names all the time, <laughs> including Brian Cox and <laughs> Hi Brian. I'm going to send you this video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going under the radar, do you? Like? Yeah. No, and it's by a fellow Britisher. Absolutely. So, Hi Brian. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Okay, good Brian. And the two of you should meet, uh, Brian. She, you should have. Um, Jude on your show, uh, you know, which is a great show anyway. I'd love um, to do uh, that, Brian, because I, I really love what you do, but I think this, this really is, could be a game changer. Correct. Could be a game changer. Okay, so let's go a little further. Mm -hmm. um, we say consciousness, and right now you're talking about cosmic consciousness mm -hmm. as the plenum, plenum yes, yes. or the, the ground, ground, of the ground of all existence, the ground of being. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, uh, human consciousness right now. We are humans, sure. uh, which is the category of consciousness. Sure. And I've always thought of other species, including plants, uh, mm. including this uh, plant, or other species mm. from microbes to, um, uh, you know, all the animals, yes. as species of consciousness. What do you think of that term? Well, going back to what I said, that in my view, you know, what this is showing, what the, you know, what I've written in the cosmic hologram, or what the evidence is showing across all scales of existence and many, many different fields of research, is that consciousness isn't what we have. It's literally what we and the whole world are. Now, we can widen that to say mind, and of course, you know, many folks and leading edge scientists have said, you know, our universe isn't a great thing, it's a great mind. mind big thought. Exactly, it's a great thought. And, and so that's what the evidence is really pointing to. So if our universe is a great thought, then essentially we are microcosmic co-creators mm -hmm. of its evolving intelligence. And everything that manifests has universal worth, you know, has a, a sacredness because of that manifestation as part of a universe. So all sentient beings, which is yes. an Eastern term, yes. are species of consciousness. I would say our entire universe is mind and then consciousness becomes a discussion of levels of awareness and self-awareness self within that. Yeah, but also the awareness in other species. Very right? much, absolutely. Because yes. maybe they don't have reflective awareness as we do. But they are but they're, they're part of this great thought. thought. Therefore okay. of course they're so then would you say it's time to revise Darwinian evolution? Again, anytime I say that uh, people uh, point their guns at me, <laughs> but I've always kind of thought, uh, and it's part of Eastern wisdom traditions, sure. that the evolution of species is actually the evolution of consciousness, of species of consciousness. I would very much agree with that, and also the evidence I'm, I'm showing in the book shows how systems are co-evolutionary partners. Um, very much, and how it's the informational relationships, the dynamic relationships that actually are continuing. And you know, when you have a period of time as the Holocene is, where the environment has been relatively stable, then there's been very little speciation. It's been very slow in that regard. But we know from the past that through the sort of longer range cycles, you know, the Milankovitch cycles, which are different but go up to about 40,000 years ice ages come and go, there's more speciation because the environment and its, its, its entities, as it were, the living, the biological entities within it, um, you know, do evolve to adapt. But the greatest evolutionary processes have taken and the great accelerations have taken, been taken after near mass extinctions, such as the dinosaurs, dinosaurs. And, and so adapt dramatically to be able to continue and continue complexity. And, you know, for the last 4,000, well, for the last 4 billion years, 
that's been the story of life on Gaia. There's been slow, the interrupted, you know, punctuated in equilibrium in evolutionary terms, but you can actually, and biologists now are re-looking at that in terms of information and dynamic informational patterns that but underlie the what's The generator of information obviously is consciousness. Of course. So right now there are many theories of mm-hmm. consciousness, as mm-hmm. you know, sure. you know, from uh, sure. uh, Penrose hammer off and sure. microtubules to integrated information to on and on. on, and, on. and I, I keep uh, saying to myself that all these theories of consciousness are in consciousness anyway. You know, yes. you need consciousness <laughs> exactly. to create a theory. It's all a work in progress. <laughs> right. But as you know, the most fashionable theory right now, or one of the most fashionable theories, is integrated information yes. leading to consciousness. But you're saying the reverse. You're saying that Consciousness creates integrated information. I'm saying it's it's a dance. It, it's it, otherwise we're still in duality. We're still mm-hmm. saying that that does that, that does that. Okay. Whereas it's an emergent process of it. I mean, I talk about um, if we look at information at its most basic, we could say information is the, the letters of the alphabet. Mm-hmm. When we start to put letters together, together. To, to make words, mm-hmm. meaning is added relation is added, patterning is added. When we put those words in human terms into a sentence, a poem, mm-hmm. a song, a play, there's deeper meaning. So in a sense, it's it's a, a beautiful sort of enrichment. In a way, that's DNA as well, right? yes. in the alphabet of life, yes. DNA being the alphabet, genes exactly. being the words, and the body being a story. Exactly. And also this sense of, and this is really, you know, um, I wouldn't say speculative in terms of its totality, but it's less evidentially based at the moment. But it seems that that information, there's also a pull as well as a push. Mm -hmm. There's also a sort of a a potential, Mm -hmm. a potentiality of the template, which is emergent. Mm -hmm. So there is a sort of a higher level coherence within evolutionary processes. Is there feedback? There seems to be, but it's still a, a movement from simplicity to complexity. And in almost like a synchronistic movement, exactly. holographically. Exactly, exactly. In a synchronistic movement. So, you know, um, this is great. It's, it's the best story um, of evolution, cosmology that I've heard in recent times. But it's still a story. Would you agree that yes. all stories, including scientific stories, are models? They're not ultimate reality, although they point to the ultimate reality. Yeah, I think all of this is a work in progress. I think one thing that is important now is that we've had this dichotomy between spiritual traditions and that deep sort of inner knowingness of interconnectedness, mm-hmm. and yet a mainstream scientific paradigm that said, no, 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 no everything's separate and essentially our universe is meaningless. Mm -hmm. The evidence, and this is why it's taken me 60 years to write this book, um, is that the evidence is now in across, as I said, all scales of existence and many fields. This isn't just about physics. No, but the evidence is in, but nobody still, or very few people are pointing to consciousness as the fundamental... But this is what the book does. And, And so what I'm hoping is that by bringing the scientific evidence that now does reconcile with spiritual traditions, Mm -hmm. that we can literally, instead of coming from a place of separation Mm -hmm. and trying to find some ways of coming together, we could turn around and say, actually, you know, our universe is a great thought within an infinite cosmos, unified reality. So how do we understand, experience, and embody unity awareness? Because I'm a healer as well, and I know that all our... You know, the sustainable development goals that the UN put together, which is an amazing achievement, are attempts to deal with our dysfunctional behaviours that are themselves symptoms of our collective dis-ease of a fragmented perspective. Mm -hmm. So if we can do all we can with that, but if we can go to the basis, and you're a healer too, you know that unless you deal with the cause of a dis-ease, it will find other ways of creating symptoms. Mm -hmm. This hopefully could be a game changer of actually healing our fragmented perspectives. And it is a point too, it is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, scientific evidence is so compelling that information and therefore consciousness is the grounding of everything. And the appearance of our universe emerges 
as a co-creative dynamic existence and exploration and experiencing evolving of intelligence. It's beautiful. Now let me share with you something that I try with other people and I'm not going to experiment with you. But I'm, <laughs> I'm just You're going not going to, to sort of hurt no, me. No, no, <laughs> you know, if I ask somebody, what's this? They'll say it's a candy. If I ask them, um, what is this? They'll say it's a plant. What's this? A watch. This is a hand. Mm. And this is a shirt. This is a body. This is a nose. This is a face. But before we can say that, point to this object, mm. before we can do that and call it a candle, mm. it's an experience. Yeah. And of course, it's an experience in consciousness. Yeah. And as the experience we call seeing, this is just a shape mm -hmm. and a color and uh, a form. Yeah. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. The word candle is a human construct mm -hmm. for that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? Uh, this is similarly as seeing, mm -hmm. it's the shape, a color, a form. The mm -hmm. word candle, uh, the word watch, yeah. or the word hand, or, yeah. is a human construct for that experience. Yes. So, basic experience is a sensation mm -hmm. or a perceptual experience mm -hmm. in consciousness. Mm -hmm. and it's also species specific because this would not be the, ex you know, a snake wouldn't know this as this experience that we have. Have a very different experience, different experience in terms of well, all those senses. So yeah. everything that we call physical reality yeah. is a species-specific experience in consciousness. Yes. But humans have the ability to reify that evanescent sensation because these sensations are very evanescent, you know? Yes. Like seeing is every act of perception is a creation. Exactly. I look this way, I look this way, and I create this experience in consciousness. Yes. And if we actually kind of dumb down the words that we give to experiences, whether it's seeing or hearing mm -hmm. or this, you ultimately end up with this conclusion that what we call matter yeah. uh, is actually a reified form of a reification of sensations. Absolutely. Matter is a sensation yeah. in consciousness. Yes. But by reifying it, mm -hmm. giving it a name, mm -hmm. and then breaking it down into bits and pieces, mm -hmm. particles and all that, uh, we suddenly have the ability to create a scientific story and technology and yeah. atom bombs and, all, and all everything the else and yeah. all, all the sure. good stuff and yeah. the bad stuff. Sure. But unless we understand that matter itself is a concept in consciousness. Completely, right? completely. I mean, what I say is that, you know, and this is where I think technology is great fun at the moment because the virtual realities of our technologies and the holograms, our man-made holograms. This is a virtual reality. This yeah, but it, yeah. I mean, I would use slightly different words to say that the virtual realities and holograms of our human technologies are kids' toys, for which the universe is a masterclass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, very nice. How about the human brain? Mm -hmm. yeah, because you know, of course, there are species that have no brains like this but have awareness, right? Yes, um, have intelligence. They don't have a centralized processing system yeah. that we would recognize as a brain, but the mycelium yeah. root systems of trees right. are essentially the, the, the information transceivers of, of the trees. So the human brain, mm -hmm. you know, which I, again, Michael Shermer, I hope you're watching this. <laughs> Okay, and I'll send it to you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Michael. <laughs> okay, uh, and my co-author, uh, Leonard, uh, uh, Leonard uh, Malodna, who wrote uh, Briefer History of Time with Steve Hawkins. Wonderful. He and I wrote this book, uh, War of the World Wars. Yes, so, I read that. Okay, we've become friends, but Excellent. we still don't agree about anything. <laughs> so, Michael, I'm going to send you... Um, this uh, video, and I'm also going to send it to you, Leonard. And I, 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 Leonard. I want, I, I want your reaction. But um, what I was going to say right now is that um, coming back to the brain, mm. the human brain. Mm. My knowledge of the human brain is 
uh, derived in the same way as my knowledge of this. Mm. Right? Yeah. The human brain is a perceptual experience. Mm. And, and the word brain is a human construct for another mode of knowing and experience. Yes, it is. And it's interesting, of course, that in cosmological terms, we talk about the holographic boundary of what the appearance of our universe is as a brain, B-R-A-N-E. And, of course, a friend and colleague of ours, Bruce Lipton, yes. talks about the membrane of cells as where the sort of the informational transceiving is. So it all, you know, it all connects in in that regard. But as you know, in, in, in um, the field of consciousness, including Anel Sait, I hope you're watching this, <laughs> and if you're not, I'll send it to you. So Anel Sait is in Surrey, uh, University of Surrey. He, he did a brilliant talk at TED of how the human brain creates a controlled hallucination mm -hmm. that we call the universe. But actually the brain, the body, mm -hmm. and the universe are a unified experience in exactly. consciousness, right? Yes. So where I'm going is uh, I'm suggesting that the brain is not the producer of consciousness, but another participant in your Indeed, hologram. a transceiver as part of a, a, a human template of that microcosmic co-creativity and experience. And, and uh, we are forced to talk in dualistic terms because that's how language is. It is. But actually, the human brain, the human body, yes. the human all mind, of the, all of the, and all, all of the other brains and bodies are part it's of unified. this uh, exactly. unified, evolving exactly. system. Exactly. In consciousness. Exactly. Well, if you haven't had a uh, good experience by right now, then I would say your humanity is incomplete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I didn't say that. <laughs> we, uh, so you need to read the book and you need to listen to this over and over again and see it over and over again. And uh, Jude, it's a great privilege to meet you, but uh, we shall meet again. I, I have a conference every other year called Sages and Scientists and I'm putting it together now so I'll, I'll be reaching out to you. That would be wonderful. I'd love to be part okay. of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Deepak. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thank Thanks Tayana.